thank you to the musicians for the great start to today. Um, I'm going to read from the last book, Profit and Loss, and because I have longer to read than I have been given to read from this book before, you'll probably hear quite a lot of it. Um, but I'm going to begin with uh, poems from the first half of the first section of the book about houses and rooms. And I'll start with the first one I wrote, which was written about a house I'd lived in in North Belfast, where in 1949 uh, a woman had been murdered by a painter and decorator. Or rather, he was tried and convicted, and then it was overturned. The um, sentence was overturned. Uh, and the house was largely unchanged. So it was an interesting turn to uh, write this there. And it's called the, no the Notorious Case of Robert the Painter. I once lived in the house of an infamous death. Time and the tidal nature of the streets, Baltic, Pacific, Atlantic Avenue had almost washed it off. But late that summer, my mother remembered hearing of the murder. When he had choked her and hit her on the head and stabbed her four or five times with a carving knife, the killer caught the public imagination by scalding the woman with hot broth from the stove. He walked away through the wire tents post-war streets. At night in the ashes of my own affairs, I doused each room for signs of macabre or frisson, but the past remained dust. It would not stir at the thought of her votive lamps, of the floor where her dentures fell, or her roses in the garden, blooming yearly. <coughs> and I always begin with that on, on the ground, that if you begin with a hideous murder, um, things can only can get better after that. Because people tend to go, yes, 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 thank you. The poem about the woman who was horribly murdered. Um, I don't quite know why you're telling us that. It might become clear. Uh, so this is called Reminders. Um, and it's about my, my parents, uh, my mother's house. And this, I've made this joke before, but it is actually true uh, that when she read this, she, the, objection, the objection she had to the poem was that I referred to her kitchen as small. <laughs> and I, uh, I said, well, when I read it, I'll say that you got the extension, which is true. <laughs> so it's called Reminders. The bin collections and the times of mass, the names and dosage of prescription drugs, my parents measure out their hours in this small back kitchen, regular as ties, soothed by a filling kettle and a radio. A fly completes a brisk Grand Prix style circuit around the room, then rests against the pane. Don't leave key in the lock, reads a note in capitals, pinned to the back door, above the key in the lock. <laughs> um, this is called The Day We Discovered Pornography in the Mail, so apologies in advance. Um, before internet pornography, it's very quaint, it's kind of, you know, old fashioned. It's true as well. And the last line is either rude or very, very rude, depending on your interpretation. The Day We Discovered Pornography in the Mail. I once lived in a rented red brick house where everyone signed on and slept till noon. That summer, the city stood like an open door into a room where something had just ended. The wine glasses abandoned in the first dawn light. Because we were so young and so belated, because we wanted nothing and expected nobody, the day we discovered pornography in the mail was a revelation. It seemed a sudden windfall or a hoopla tossed with skill over the rooftops. We wanted to meet with gentle reverence to the envelope where it lay behind the door, or to take it up like a rose between our teeth. We wanted to trace that name through the empty streets. We wanted to cheer him for making a fist of it. So as well as writing poems about um, rooms and houses, I was writing about um, things that were left, uh, maybe left behind in rooms, so I'll read two poems um, about that. And the first one is about a plant that I was given by a friend when she left Belfast and she couldn't bring with her, uh, so she gave to me to look after, which I seriously and miraculously didn't kill, um, but survived and still survives. So it's called The Peace Lily. In the corner of the room, the potted peace lily throws up its waxy leaves towards the light. 
How many grim locations around town, passed on from friend to friend, has it called home? It rustles, hello, hello, with calm <coughs> neglect. How many front rooms has the lily known? Slamming their packed cars closed, departing friends couldn't find space enough. But look, she thrives in the corner of the room. The potted peace lily throws up her waxy flowers like spears of light. Um, and as a kind of partner to that, I was thinking about the most embarrassing thing you could leave behind in a house, um, and it's not true, and I would say this, but anyway, it's not true. And I used to like this poem, I was very embarrassed by it for a long time, that, that kind of ebbs and flows, um, for some reason. But uh, it's not true, again, I do keep saying it, it's called, it's called, uh, it's called The Vibrator, and I was thinking what would be very embarrassing. When you had packed up all your books and clothes and taken the last crap poster down and walked like a mournful ghost through the blank familiar rooms, a thought struck, clang, loud as a two-pence piece in a metal bucket. Where was the vibrator? Oh, cruel gods, O oh, vulgar implement that was stowed discreetly on some shelf or cupboard, but has almost certainly not been boxed away. O oh, dirty gift of doubtful provenance, Oh, gift, surprise, for next week's settling tenants. <laughs> oh, nice surprise for next week's settling tenants. Four Polish men paying peanuts by the hour. For in Belfast, too, the market holds its sway. To find in some nook or niche hole the vibrator still beats in the dark its battery-powered cart. I did live in a flat, which when I moved out four quarters people moved in, it does not mean the rest of it's true. Um, so I'll read two more poems about things. Uh, um, so things going out of date, things that were um, becoming kind of old fashioned or seeming to um, become obsolete in some ways uh, were also on my mind at this time. So I wrote a poem about a floppy disk. Um, now I know people still use floppy disks, and, but uh, I, I can't, I don't have a disk drive. I have all these floppy disks and I haven't labelled them and I find them and I have no idea what, what I once put on them. And, uh, uh, it seems like they didn't get a very long time to be, you know, modern. Um, and so I wrote this poem for the floppy disks, specifically the floppy disks containing work that I wrote and I can't read easily. I could go to somebody else's house or something. So, and the first uh, sentence is a uh, reference to the fact that they're not, obviously they're not floppy. Uh, <laughs> so, the floppy disk. Prince among misnomers, the floppy disk lies stranded in drifts of dust in the top desk drawer. A castaway on shingly paper clips or under an old bank statement, the small withdrawals dwindling to little, then less, then nothing at all. How young it is to be so obsolete. The stainless steel clip shines, the neat black case still sleek as a woman's <coughs> suit or evening purse. I will take it between my finger and my thumb and post it with a click through the squarish slot of the oh so recent, stunningly useless past. The moment before the moment before now, whose code is lost. The words that tapped and flashed like a frantic bird against a window pane, translate back to the gesture of the hand, stalled on the keys like the spirit on the water, like the shouts and groans that issue from the mind after the prop has snapped. The floppy disk is the love note still sealed in its envelope. It's the marker blank above its own strange grave. Another thingy, thingy poem. Um, some, some people have heard of Super Sarah and some people haven't. This is the Haven't audience. Super Sarah? No? Yeah? You Irish? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. People who haven't heard of it don't care. People who have have usually quite a like, strong emotional response. Like, oh yeah, Super Sarah, oh yeah. Um, because it was supposed to be a portable heater, gas port heater, but in fact you couldn't really move it because it was so heavy that as soon as it was had enough gas to, to be functional, you, you couldn't actually move it. Um, so you 
take about four people to push it into a room, and then you just switch it on, and everyone would immediately fall asleep because uh, because of the gas. So uh, it seems to me you probably are better when it's maybe ours was faulty, and uh, so you can choose between being warm and being awake. And um, and anyone I've talked to has said, "Oh, we have super oh my God, super blue." So I know they're not actually like, they're not up to sleep, you still get them, but um, you probably shouldn't. That's really good to see. <laughs> And I was always surprised that my editor, who has insisted that I change some things when they're too plain and too um, blunt, he, he nevertheless, <laughs> he nevertheless didn't change or didn't make me change the first line of this. Just was like, really? So anyway, super sour. It emitted a mushroom smell. It was mobile when empty, uselessly heavy when full. When one or other sibling shoved it in on wayward squeaking wheels. The collective gas was the premature exit of half the room's oxygen. It was very ugly. With hindsight, was it quite safe? It looked like a cross between a TV robot and a roadside shrine in Italy or France. When I read how Lucy received the visions of hell, I deliberately toasted my toes upon its grill, just like Catholics did in books, and then drifted back to St. Elsewhere, Dallas, for the Antiques Roadshow. The upper atmosphere of roiling cloud, our trade off with the cold that cut the glass with the shapes made out of dark, while our whole stunned clan slumped safe and half stifled on some Sunday in the middle of an era. So, and so, I might brought up Catholic just in case you thought I was there, because somebody's going to be Catholic. But, um, which is pretty obvious, in fact, as the following poem would probably. Uh, suggest. But I'll finish with three poems about family because as well as writing poems about rooms and houses and things and rooms and houses, I was writing about my family, um, who are very obliging about the fact that I do this, mostly. Um, because there are also things that you find you know, in rooms. You know, open a door in a house and there they are. Uh, and I was spending more time with my parents because my father had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease to nobody's great surprise. It must be said. He was already very uh, uh, ill, um, and I was pregnant, which uh, was, a, was a huge thing for the poems because I went from feeling, I think, sort of, you know, an isolated, self-contained creature to feeling very contingent on these provisional histories. I think, um, and particularly on um, that of my maternal grandmother, um, who had 13 children, which became a little bit more real when I was uh, pregnant. And uh, in particular, the story of, that surrounded that, which was that she had had five children and the eldest was, was killed in a, in a car accident or was run, run over. Uh, after which she just kept having children, including my mother, who was born on the anniversary of her death. And um, it's one of the stories that I think a lot of people have in their families, and they just kind of go, oh yeah, you're born on the anniversary of your death, that's right, yeah. <laughs> um, when you're young, and then you go, when you're about 30, then you sort of go, that's actually terrible. Which is like, that's just awful. Uh, so I wrote this poem for the little girl who died, and I know I have a relative in tonight, but uh, who's also the same thing. She was called Colette. Um, I think it had huge repercussions beyond anyone's understanding, or, or my understanding. And they found her shoe, the little girl's shoes, in my, in my granny's uh, bedside locker, and when she died, you know. Uh, so I wouldn't be here, and neither would my, my mum wouldn't be born. Since her name dropped like a stone in the women's talk, I am haunted by the ghost of my mother's sister. She comes to me out of 1939 in a little white dress and pristine Mary Janes, clutching the gloves she had dropped on the Donegal Road. She stoops from the curb. The Donegal Road, the West, is a disused room in my family's house of history. The distaff wing, the city's seed off place. She steps from the curb to the not quite lorry free roads of 1940. Next year, my mother is born. Next year to the day. My mother's birthday cake is iced in black and sweetened with black ashes. The candle flames are little points of dark, as dead as her dead sister's eyes that day on the Donegal Road. The name they sang, her name. Colette, Colette, 
My grandmother's atonement for being so provocatively bereaved is to lay her wound like a flower on heaven's altar. The virgin smiles and gleams to soothe her brow. After my mother, she begets seven sons. Colette, Colette, your name is a hiccup of grief and the hollow knock inside an empty closet. A seed of loss, it sprouts beyond the day we tuck your little shoes, now yellow with age, like a breech birth in the soil of Granny's grave. And I read one from my father and then my mother, and then we're having a break. So, this is called My Father's Language, and it was written um, about five years ago, or five years ago, yeah, when my father began to lose his uh, vocabulary, having uh, uh, kind of lost a lot of his short-term memory already. Um, um, it was about my, my efforts to communicate, I suppose, um, with him anyway. So, my father's language. When my father sits in the straight-back leather chair, the room contains him as my head contains the thought of him. As though in the gathering darkness, made safe by the position of a rug or lamp, he is not being lost to shadows and incoherence. As though he is not being lost to the drift of age, Alzheimer's slow accumulation of losses. First memory, the near shore of my father's life, licked by the small waves, starts to grow faint and vague. Next, it is swept clear by the escaping tide. First memory, then language. What process of attrition, tangles, textbooks, and sort of fatty wax? sees him revert to his spoken Anglo-Saxon. His language rattles in its dearth of nouns. Everything is a thing. Where is the thing for the thing? Where is the thing, the thing you know, the thing? In this bone dry wasteland where the nouns have died, daughter might sometimes be confused with wife. I say, the thing is not lost. No, take this thing. Here is the thing, the thing, daddy, take this thing. And um, one more. Um, this poem, the last poem, has a terrible title, for which I apologise in advance. Um, it sounds like a TV movie. Um, and it's based on something my mother told me I said as a child, which she thought was very endearing and very sweet. A little anecdote, which of course I was already indifferent to for a lot of time. Um, uh, and she was, you use that when you're later, you write something about that. But I wrote about how she sort of thought I would write about more really. So it's called, um, and I was trying to imagine how she felt as a mother with five, five kids um, before I really, really you know, got any experience of it. Um, which I think she quite liked, she was quite good at it. Um, controversial, I quite like that. Um, so it's called There's Birds in My Story. On the orange and brown and the lining the playroom, my infant self is playing with That's Right dolls. A wave of salt tenderness picks up my mum where she stands, carries her off with a lurch to some far giddy shore, then sets her back on her feet when I ask, can she whistle? Since my mother fell down the invisible rabbit hole, through the isolation, hysterics and old wives' tales into stay-at-home motherhood, things have been pretty weird. She regards for a beat her fat second youngest child, then pushes, purses her lips, Hui hui, hui hui, hui hui. Hui hui, hui hui, hui hui, hui hui, hui hui. My mother's not whistle, I have to say that. The terms in the job description clearly state that when a small child requests whistling, you oblige. And my epic response when she stops to inquire just why, keep whistling, mummy, there's birds in my story. <laughs> Since my mother stepped through the invisible looking glass into full time mumdom, each day, some current frets at her sense of self. But yes, she thinks, there are birds wheeling in land, all whips and bright, hungry eyes, in the noon light over the estuary, flying lighter than sparks. Thank you very much. For this, um... <laughs> uh, I'm going to read you just one poem um, for the next I think it takes 20 minutes to read, it might take a little bit less um, if I go very fast. 
Jay used to do. Uh, so it's a long poem. Um, I've only read it once all the way through before publicly, and I coughed after a certain point, so hope that doesn't happen. But it was written um, as a counterpart to some of the poems I read in the first half um, of private family history. So I had an idea about again about five years ago to write a, a poem which had a sort of public um, uh, took account of some sort of public or social changes. Uh, and the impetus for it, I'll just say a wee bit about it, was I was moving house, I was clearing out boxes of um, rubbish I'd been carrying around for about 15 years, and I had the idea to write about some of the things I was coming across, um, which I'd been, um, I had some of my own um, junk really, which were going out of date, like floppy disks and things from the last uh, um, part of the reading. Um, uh, I had a little, give a sense of maybe the social changes that had taken place in the 15 or so years since I'd uh, left home. Um, and so I was finding Polaroid photos and um, sort of pre-internet and pre-peace uh, uh, process uh, uh, artifacts. Uh, and I had an idea to write about that, uh, some way, sort of a long poem. Uh, in the middle of all this, I went to Iceland for no particular reason in the middle of winter, and I read a letter to Lord Byron by W.H. Um, and I thought that this was, you know, this, this was great, um, addressing the spirit of the age in, in a terribly high-handed and critical way. Uh, I realised I should have written it in Rhyme Royal, which he did, but it was too late, he'd already written too much of it. And, um, but I tried to borrow some of his uh, obnoxious tone <laughs> in the middle of the poem. Um, and to make it a kind of journal or a chronicle of a certain particular time. Um, and uh, I give it a, begin, a, a, a pretty arbitrary beginning and end. So it begins in 2008 when they opened the West Link motorway in Belfast and it immediately flooded. The underpass and it immediately opened it and it just flooded, it filled up with water. And everyone, the people of Belfast, said that's because of the Romanians. And I never understood <laughs> what they meant, but that's what I remember, it's just the Romanians. Um, and I finished it with the uh, uh, Barack Obama's uh, inauguration. And that the last part of it was written as it happened in 2008. And that has the banks collapsed. Um, and then uh, Obama was elected. So I'll see if I can <coughs> check it in. I might be able to read it all. So it's called Letter to Friends. It's summer, so of course, torrential rain has fallen now for days. It's turned the roads to rivers, first the river banks, swamped drains, and drowned in a cataclysm of soupy floods, a traffic tunnel opened weeks ago. The cars are stranded on this motorway turned waterway, the pass is an impasse. And so, to pass the time, I watch the slow drip and dissolve of stuff that floats away. My face is reflected in the steamy glass. Recently, I've been thinking of my friends, and how, when the last millennium rolled over like an old dog, the whole world didn't end. The slideshow function on my Mac's screensaver shows us uploaded, newly digitised, fading across the distance of the screen, and each now seems an electronic ghost. Things carried on. Were we perhaps surprised, and are we still? What happened in between those and these days? What has been gained or lost? All week, it has been freezing in the flat where after how many moves, I've had, to, I've had to sift through boxes of old junk I've kept so that it seems preserved this stuff as in a drift of snow. Old notes and diaries under ice, photos from photo booths, my anxious faces, glossed in IDs from universities. Strange when you hit a place to try it twice, let alone three times. All those hairstyles, phases, freeze frames of myriad intensities. And strange too how much of it is obsolete already, though these days we're classed as youth till 44. In here, among receipts for gifts long given and lost, I found such proof of history's incessant forward schlep, picking up speed of late, as artifacts that now seem relics from some ancient bureau, 
There is Exhibit A, a 90 minute tape filled with sad songs, a battered fine effects, and some notes for countries long since using Euro. There are fragile concertated inventories for short and long haul flights, not booked online, but in an actual travel agent. These <coughs> contain release a faint whiff of old nicotine from trips on which assorted passengers could while away the journey smoking fags in designated rows, seats A, B, C. Now, the more planes, they shoot the messengers who say so, fill the sky up with their dregs. Smoking ranks under knife crime, socially. There is an old address book listing rented dives. The place before the place, a place ago, of some old friends, and weird diminutive phone numbers that seem missing a first O, which pumps a mental troll back to the ones we had as kids, before successive codes lengthened their, what, five digits, maybe less? And then at dawns, there are no mobile phones, just ancient landlines pegged along the roads, and not a solitary email address. There are boarding passes, rail cards, ticket stubs. Whether what stopped me throwing them away was sentiment or sloth, my corny slob's memory board lets me now retrace a day ten years ago. I called a bus, then train. I've kept receipts of both fares, see the rings left by my coffee on the jolting trip. From Edinburgh to Glasgow, back again. And in between, of all the vital things, a humbug, a humbug wrapper and a hand-drawn map. <coughs> There's a photo of me drunk at Marx's grave, a photocopied flyer for a show in Amsterdam, two giant cornflakes, they bleached out on faintly mugdy. There's a row of smiling, half-recalled contemporaries, caught, though now faded, in a Polaroid, at some event or other in the town. There are photos of old boyfriends, number three is absent, I note, at weddings, trips abroad, and one in New York before the towers came down. Here we are grinning at the Empire State. Why are we happy? Why are we not in tears bound by foreknowledge? Caught between this note, which warns my student loan is in arrears, assorted postcards pinned to flaking walls and awful flats, Chagall, Matisse, George Brack, and one unfilled paroxetine prescription. There are steps from folded periodicals, thanks for your short, excruciating work. Find info enclosed, still there, about a subscription. There's a desolate financial paper trail. Follow it one way, and it leads to me, unpropertied, unkempt, unwell, yet still enjoying unexpected solvency. But trace it back the other way through slips from temp jobs, doll books, and P45s, to summer work whose terms I can't make out. And hoopla, I shed myself with paper clips, with tax and housing benefits, till I left myself bureaucratically quite naked. Naked, or worse, flayed, flinching, overwrought. An insect bolting underneath a stone, shocked by some awful hand or sudden light, couldn't have had less functional backbone than this sardonic looking idiot, me if you're asking, propped beside a lamp, a drink in hand at some unwholesome hour. I want to know what makes my eyes dilate or nostrils flare, crouched in the sweaty damp of that old bedsit, why stuff mattered for. This box of doodles, bills, old cards and prints have meanings which are growing out of date. I can't recall their felt significance like negatives developed decades late, in which we find, above all else, exposed thwack, like a drop kick to the heart, the gap between our sense of then and of today. No matter that the photograph was posed, or artful as the track list of this tape, which now I find I have no means to play. Part two. This is, usually, this is just a bit I know maybe. Then people wonder why I came to another thing, but anyway, part two. Another thing, it's hard to see just why we got ourselves worked up into such states. For years, my chief mood was anxiety and boredom mingled. Jesus, the debates, the books we loved that others must love too, or they have been writing some good explanation, an alibi, perhaps a doctor's note. Why would I never read Catch-22 or Mervyn Peake? Who rated Philip Larkin, Hal Ashby films, or what Ring Lardner wrote? 
How quaint to think we few, we happy few, went to some graphic novel, yoke the fate of getting lost around 1992 for 15 years, then figuring, too late, that reading stuff was, yeah, like, well and good. I love the way our students talk today. We were going to need, like, some employment, that we were going to need some livelihood, some media job from which our minds might stray. These days, we work flat out at our enjoyment. Indeed, our ways to waste time are so many, they'd make a longer book than Ulysses, whatever that is. The cacophony of texts and tweets and emails, although these are hardly done exclusively for pleasure, but operate like bat squeaks in a cave, to steer us in the dark, it seems to me. And what does a flying bat know about leisure? Squeaking perforce from bat birth to bat grave. Man can't bear too much reality TV. But this is our life, half virtual, half flesh. The instant message and the feedback loop, the tailored advertisement made of fresh with each mouse click, the generally crap factoids and news light that we read online, the grace of touchscreen, and the thrill unchecked of transatlantic, transworld conversation, status updates, the anxious feeling fine, squeaking across the void, only connect, Leontia is loving all this information. But here, though, poetry, the holy grail so long, the language at its highest power, has got its marks back from the public, fail and fail again. The reasons for this are, A, that it's quaint, and B, that it's obscure. It flourishes and willed opacities or verbal tics that people can't forgive. The problem is, we're not sure what it's for. It's out of step with our capacities for being literal and lucrative. Like visual art in London when it shocks. But hold on now, you argue that it's crass to gauge a thing's success and earning bucks or wish the poems be consumed en masse, like novels by celebrities or booze, or right-wing tabloids sold by big tycoons, or applications when they're bought by Apple. I mean, is it too much to hope we choose amid this stream of books, texts, films and tunes, some oddball words with which one has to grapple? Yet, now I find I'm falling out of line with certain good ambassadors who state, in terms of literature, we're doing fine, we've never been so keen or literate, we've never been so schooled and only snobs, preaching apocalypse are thus inclined to argue things are less than hunky-dory, or less than bright, and yet, and yet a mob's no less a mob, well, fed and disciplined, as Eliot wrote, but that's a different story. What else is new then? Belfast, long the blank and blocked on lines, has now brought to an end, or several ends, its grim, traumatic fight, the payoff packet and the dividend, amid the double deals, halts and heists, a building boom and shopping walls thrown up like flotsam by our new security. Here are our palaces of snow and ice, and so folks with esprit de corps, we shock ourselves to civilise maturity. Belfast aspires to be, then, every place where shopping is done less for recreation. This might apply to all the Western race than from a kind of civic obligation. The upshot, on the whole, we are better dressed, as Gordon wrote, though maybe on the whole, we find we suffer no less from neurosis. Despite our retail therapy, we are depressed, tired or infertile, find some book or poem. Each week I hear of a fresh diagnosis. Among old friends, at least. It's not, I think, merely the fallout from a far off war fought in our names, not so remote its stink can't reach us in our hiding places, nor fears for our planet that make us feel sad, the waste, the global warming, melting ice, our ravenous consumption of resources. Though if you would gain say that this news is bad, I plug my laptop in to read it twice, such are depths of my profound remorses. Are we deprived that faith is in decline? I mean, the Christian faith, except it's not. Google US and fundamentalism and the prophets. Yes, okay, we smell the rot as green as grass within the Church of Rome, it's awful crimes. But there are hardly, there are other flocks in whom the spirit's hardly wearing thin, so much as changing shape. It has a home, now, hear me out, in eco-politics, for carbon footprint trying replacing sin, are we depressed then about women's status? Hardly, we're not quite clear who women are. They're strong, empowered, they don't just peel potatoes. They work, they breed, they even fight the war. They cold dance, but they shouldn't. 
No, they should. They're top consumers and they're radicals. They're both oppressed and set free by the veil. Yes, were I a student of their subject to it, I'd find them elusive all as particles. Conversely, one hardly hears from men at all. Okay, I've said enough. It's not polite to babble on at such prosaic length without referring back to check your right behind me, though one might say that's the strength of writing in a mostly private mode. It leaves you very free to bang your drum, preach to empty classrooms, daring lessons. <coughs> Forgive me, I'm surprised how fast it flowed, or that it's flowed at all, how far we've come, or feel we've come, since our long adolescence. This is the last bit, I keep turning this around. My enthusiasm. Okay, the end is in sight. Um, this is the end. October's been a scary month for news. The wobble, trip and fall of several banks had freaked us out before across the seas. Debt spread, spread like ripples in a ripple time. So Alden and McNeese out on their rambles round Iceland, where I was a year ago, would hardly have guessed this outpost part was key in all this mess. How its financial gambles while global warming melts the Arctic snow, have frozen up its whole liquidity. The problem was, it seems, the price of houses, like sparks caught in an updraft, rose and rose, till men in suits decided future prices were capital enough to sell to those who hadn't, which when things went wrong spelled trouble, not just for folk left paying through the nose their mortgage, which apparently means death grip, but all along the line, the bursting bubble dried up the cash, and to mix metaphors one last time, credit sank in the same ship. And offering stiff competition to this strife in fiscal matters to the bank's collapse, our daily threats brought to our way of life by man-made imminent apocalypse, though neither really outweighs private grief or private fears. Last year, I read The Road by Cormac McCarthy up in sunny Bergen. Now there's a romp, parental love, belief, and cannibals. Oh God, I'd take the blade to my own throat before I read it again. My father's wits have thrown away like birds out of that shell, though on the odd good day, watching him walk or do some task when words aren't called for or my thoughts drift. Well then, hey, things are just fine. Who knows, the heart that breaks daily at each new symptom of decline isn't my own obstruction I can bear. And then that bubble bursts, my shoulder aches under its flu jab, and it strikes again how weird it is to miss him when he's there. What other good news from the land of grim prognosis where the headlines fight it out to do as fastest? Where, caught through the dim nightmare of tension and of sleepless nights, I'm talking here about new motherhood, the grinding week long days, the battle zone cloaked in a flock of fog of stunned tranquility. It's glimpsed on bolting out my own dark mood, taking this form on lampposts, trees in rain, the single magpie looking back at me. These are my thoughts while driving from the ward, under a sky, perversely brilliant blue. What? Did the intensity of my tirade burn off the cloud the way the sun lifts due to bring about this sudden climate shift in Belfast? Look, each suit encrusted brick shines in a gold light pouring from above celestially, so that my spirits lift against my will. I almost want to check, flood abated, for some hovering dove. A dove, an olive branch, a ray of light. Who might have thought that only for so long might down turns turn down of wrong, that the future is bright and black, that one new powers age old wrong, should find redress, or symbol of redress, and underneath her blanket with its bear, my baby daughter, too, now lies at ease. She's six months old. The future's all a guess. My heap of junk is ready for the fire. Our lives stand waiting, primed for compromise. 20 minutes. On the door.